with you. With your spirits. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. And Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers stopped at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. We come to seek to watch with the Lord during these sacred three hours. And it's a good practice to focus on a particular grace. And one of the commentators on the spiritual exercises, he says, we should ask for the grace to have a greater interior union with Jesus and a greater knowledge of Him in our lives in order that we love Him more and follow Him more closely. As I mentioned before here at the parish, our religion is personal in the sense that it is totally based on the person and the nature of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we are not part of just some large mass of people. The Blessed Trinity, through His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, has a personal relationship with each one of us. And one of the most more uh, I would just say the more desirable things in our spiritual lives is what something called the colloquy, where we have in intimate conversation with the Lord. And the purpose of these reflections is to help us find that colloquy that we want to make with our Savior. We invoke the Holy Spirit. And we ask Our Lady of Sorrows to obtain from our Son the particular grace that God wants to give us, even if we're not aware of what that grace is. One of the most important colloquies in the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius is something called the Colloquy of Mercy. And the retreat is instructed, please, in your mind's eye, uh, imagine the Savior hanging on the cross. And you are there. There used to be a TV program years and years ago called You Are There. And the idea was to bring a person back into another time. Well, we're aided by grace. We're aided by a living relationship with the Lord to uh, put ourselves at the foot of the cross with St. John, Our Lady, with the people mocking Him. We might have our own image. I think of these powerful scenes from Passion of the Christ. Mel Gibson's film, or whatever, asking God to help us imagine the Lord there with our mind's eye. And the retreat is asked as we're looking upon the Lord and His suffering and His words that we're meditating on, to ask three questions that should recur throughout the period of devotion. What have I done for Christ? What am I doing for Christ? What ought I to do for Christ? In that spirit, we 
consider the first word. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It might be easy when we're thinking about this passage of Scripture and we hear the context that, oh, they were there mocking him and scoffing at him and making sarcastic remarks. We might have the feeling, I don't do that. That's that. Jesus says they don't know what they do. One of the things that a person who's making a retreat according to St. Ignatius, the first week is to remind them, yes, we don't know what we do with respect to our own sins, in the sense that we have very little appreciation of the malice and the destruction of sin. There's all kinds of ignorance church teaches. It's something called invincible ignorance. A person who in good faith, uh, using the grace of God, leaves them, them comes to a certain awareness of the Lord, certain things in their life. But there's the other thing called invincible ignorance. There's something with due diligence that we're required to do morally, uh, we should overcome. And the reason we make retreats and the reason we examine our consciences is because we recognize, well, we really don't know. The full effects and the malice of sin. Why, why it costs the Savior to hang there in such a horrible fashion, a horrible death. And the, the, the first week of the exercises, is precisely to beg for grace that I may feel interiorly the malice and destruction of sin, not sin in general, but my own sins, not to beat ourselves over the head, but simply to say, I want to recognize the disorder that's here. It's order of disorder. And the retreater says, and when I recognize the disorder, the prayer of the Lord, that I may cast it out, I may abandon it and embrace the order that comes to me through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is, this is the whole meaning of self-knowledge in the spiritual life. It's not about castigating ourselves in some exercise of uh, self-immolation. Self, uh, but it's simply, out of the love of the Savior, we should come to know the true malice. And that's why the saints, see, a lot of people in the world think the saints exaggerate. The saints don't exaggerate. The saints, as they come more like God, they see like God. So, in part of this to say, well, they do not know what they are doing, is for us to beg the Lord to see the disorder of our own past sins and then to cast it out. The people that are scoffing there. Chief priests and the various people. There are several malaises there. It, it doesn't sound very promising when Jesus tells a group of them prior to his passion, you will die in your sins if you do not believe that I am, as some translations say, I am he. You will die in your sins. This calls to mind something we rarely preach about, but it's in the Catechism of the Church. The sin is against the Holy Spirit. Despair. There's a, there's a species of despair. It's not quite... There's, de there's degrees of despair, but there's a the species of despair which is especially destructive in the spiritual life, which is discouragement. It's one slope. It, it, it's part of pride. But it, it can sap us. of our desire to fight and embrace the Lord's way. 
And today, a presumption of God's mercy. Mercy is mentioned all over the place today. But mercy is beholden to the truth. The truth that Christ brings us. And many people just dismiss. And we, we breathe this air. The reason I'm bringing this up, we breathe this air. It's a cultural group. These are dangers that we pray about. Obstinacy and sin and final impenitence, which our Lord was bringing up with the rulers, certain of the rulers that he was challenging. The danger for us, do we ever pray in our daily prayer, Lord, I pray for perseverance. Do we ever pray for the healthy fear? Lord, I pray that I may never be lost. See? The saints teach us, even, even after many years of living a good life, a person can be lost just for one moral sin. And people in the world hear that, oh, Father, come on, that's, that's ridiculous, that's an exaggeration. Not an exaggeration. St. Paul warns us, be careful if we think we're standing lest we fall. St. Vincent, St. Uh, Philip Neri used to pray a prayer, Lord, be careful of Philip today because he may betray you. And all we need is, is what? what people are interested in laboratories today, lab experience. All we need for a laboratory experience is St. Peter. St. Peter is boasting. I will never, never deny you. I will lay my life down for you. Resumption of one's own powers. And he, after he betrayed our Lord, went out and wept bitterly and became a changed man. Judas, on the other hand, immersed himself in what seems to be profound despair. So the, the, the word maybe is an encouragement to us to daily say to the Lord, Lord, may I not be lost, may I not betray you, may I never follow a false love which is, is opposed to the supreme love which is you. That, and then I'll close with this. I, the the um, one one uh, commentator on the exercise of this whole uh, looking at our lives and, 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 and our sins and what we know about our sins. He says, you know, the real danger is something that sounds plausible to us. Maybe we can make a deal. There's a famous scene in one of the films. And the criminal sees he's up against some choice. And he says, Edward, make a deal. And we're going to have black big deals. I, I try to avoid the choices that the Lord is demanding of me. And the, 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 this retreat master says, one of the real seductions is um, the claim to love God. But to also love something else which is opposed to God's love. And the way of the world is, I want to have, I want to claim to have both. I want to hang on to this love that I'm attached to, this, which is a disordered love. Out of God's love. And I say, well, I, I, I love God too. And the retreat, the retreat master says, no, no. Jesus says, you must love me first. You must choose. <coughs> and then he says the sad words, and when many people are forced to choose, they choose the lesser love. Because it seems more real and more attractive. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The 
Lord be with you. Read from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at Jesus, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Messiah of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. It was a description, an inscription written over him, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we have indeed been condemned justly, for we're getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Gospel of the Lord. Praise to all about mercy. Would have been excruciatingly painful for Jesus to say anything from the cross. He had five to seven inch nails driven through the nerves of his hand and his feet. He had 195 lacerations on his back would have lost a tremendous amount of blood. He hadn't eaten or drunk anything since the Last Supper the night before. When you were crucified, you were pinned back in such a way that the only way you'd be able to enunciate anything is to lift up your legs, to open up your chest cavity, to be able to speak in exhalation. To do that because of the posture would have been hard to do it with nails to the nerves of your feet would have been literally excruciating. But Jesus, over these three hours, said these seven sentences so that we would be able to enter into his heart and into his mind as he was dying to shed his mercy on us. In that first word, as Father Village just said, Jesus prayed for sinners in general. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. It was then that Jesus clued us in, that he was praying for us then, and he was exculpating us before the Father, that when we have sinned, we weren't really conscious of all the consequences of what we were doing, that if we were, if we knew that every sin, including venial, there was a choice between Christ and Barabbas, and we were saying, give me Barabbas, we would never choose that. But just like the executioners, who very well knew how to hammer a man to a cross in order to terrorize, they knew what they were technically doing, but they didn't know its meaning. Neither do we. And Jesus, not judging us, but coming as a merciful Savior was saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That word of mercy for us all is particularized in this second word of Jesus from the cross. He turns and laser beams all of that mercy for one sinner in particular. He gave that one sinner, sinner the full measure of the new and eternal covenant in the blood he was shedding for the remission of sins. Context of the dialogue with this sin is hard to fathom. Since Jesus had been pinned to the cross, four groups had been mocking him. The leaders of the people were deriding him. He saved others, let him save himself, and he's truly the Messiah. The soldiers were ridiculing him. If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. The passers-by were scoffing at him. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from that cross. And fourth, even those being crucified with him were sneering, 
St. Matthew tells us, the bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. Jesus didn't respond to the torment. He responded only by asking the Father to forgive them, for they knew not what they were doing. Jesus freely went to the cross, wasn't going to come down from it as if he were some type of WWE champion to take the Roman soldiers and the pastors by the markers, bash their heads together, take out the pins and the nails, show how he could triumph over all the evil right there at the place of the skull. If he had come down from the cross, it would have meant that there was a limit to God's love, that there was something he wasn't prepared to suffer from him, that there was a line beyond which he would not go. And if we mocked him, that was it. Salvation is done. Jesus knew that we, his disciples, would also suffer. So on the cross, he was leaving us an example, precisely by not coming down, but by remaining there until the last drop of his saving blood was shed, not by yielding to his enemies' demands, but faithfully fulfilling the will of his Father to the extreme. Jesus, the crucified lover until the end, would become our model when we're mocked, when we're suffering. The taunting that was doubtless the most difficult for Jesus to hear is not from the centurions or the chief priests or the scribes, but the ones on his left and right. Jesus, after all, hadn't even been known as the friend of tax collectors and sinners. He had risked his whole reputation for their sake. He had on that very morning been numbered a malefactor among them. He had so often defended them. He had said to the scribes and the Pharisees that the harlots and the publicans would enter the kingdom before the self-righteous. Yet even they were reviling him. But Jesus had come to offer mercy. And something happened in that thief on Jesus' right. Maybe it was watching how Jesus was suffering in contrast to the way the two others were bearing their own terrible pain. Maybe it was hearing Jesus' first words from the cross, which were truly strange words to come from a condemned and crucified criminal, still yet one said to be a king. It might have been that he just had seen his whole life flashed before him at the moment of death and wanted to go out right. But something happened to him. And St. Luke tells us that only one of the two criminals continued to taunt Jesus. As Fulton J. Sheen once said, a person has the opportunity to be noblest when he's beaten and down. Then he has a chance to, to prove his endurance, his magnanimity, and the depths of whatever goodness he may have. We see that in Jesus on the cross, but we also see it in the good thief. Even though it would have been difficult to, indeed excruciating for him to talk, he spoke up. He rebuked the other thief and said, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Indeed, we have been condemned justly, but we're getting only what we deserve. But Jesus has done nothing wrong. He stuck up for someone who's innocent. He was thinking about someone else rather than himself, which is the first step in prayer and in love. He turned to Jesus and he prayed. It was the last prayer he would ever say. Only God knows whether it was the first prayer he had ever said. And it started out simply enough. Remember me. The last prayer of anybody who's dying is that someone will care. Someone will remember when he's dead. That there'll be an obituary. That someone will show up for the execute. But the irony Jesus was going to die before the good thief. How would he remember? Were it Lord evinced some faith that he didn't think him 
himself on the same level as the malefactor in the middle. How did the good thief know that the naked, wounded, grief-stricken, insulted, despised, crucified man beside him was a king who would enter after death into his kingdom? It's only because the Holy Spirit would have told him. Just like God the Father had helped Peter to realize that Christ was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Somehow he knew that Jesus, who was about to breathe his last, would be able to remember. Somehow he got a glimpse that Jesus was going to continue in life, even though the good thief was about to die. He just has to be remembered in Christ's kingdom, knowing that Christ was going to a place he deserved, and that the thief was likely going to a totally different prayer place he had himself merited. Thief recognized that Jesus' reign was truly about to begin. Bishop Alvin Goodyear, a Jesuit bishop in India, wrote in his classic work on the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ that it's often been noticed in the life of Jesus how a grace accepted has been the harbinger of another. Jesus led his own to himself step by step. We've seen it in Simon, son of Jonah and Nathaniel, in the first days of the Jordan, in the Roman centurion at Capernaum, at the Sermon on the Mount, in the woman who was a sinner at Magdala, in the rich young man who came to him, even though in the final step he failed. When Jesus was asked for anything, when any confessed him as he wanted to be revealed, how generously Jesus poured himself out even beyond the suppliant's dreams. A paralytic came to him asking to be healed, and Jesus sent him away healed both in body and soul. A poor creature fell at his feet penitent, and he made her an intimate friend. An apostle confessed him to be the true son of God, and he made him a rock on whom he would build his church. But the greatest gift of all was for the man who showed compassion and simply asked to be remembered. Jesus turned his aching head to his companion in suffering. He spoke with that emphatic introduction that he was accustomed to use whenever he proclaimed his solemn truth. And from his throne on Calvary, he spoke and acted with the largesse of pity the King of all the kings. Amen, amen, I say to you. This day, you will be with me in paradise. The kingdom is a word not even satisfactory for Jesus to you. Something greater, paradise, is needed. A few years ago, Pope Benedict wrote in his catechesis on Christian prayer, that this word spoken by Jesus on the cross, recorded by St. Luke, is a word of hope. It's his answer to the prayer of that man being crucified with him. The good thief, like the prodigal son, comes to his senses before Jesus and repents. He realizes he's facing the Son of God who makes the very face of God visible and begs, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingly power. The Lord's answer to this prayer goes far beyond the petition. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus knows that he's entering into direct communion with the Father and reopening to man the way to God's paradise. Thus with his response, he gives the firm hope that God's goodness can also touch us. Even at the very last moment of our life, and that sincere prayer, even after a long, wrong life, can encounter the open arms of the good Father who awaits the return of his much-loved Son. Goodyear says, Jesus' language was language worthy of a conqueror, spoken on a field where a battle has been won. It was a reward worthy of Jesus Christ, the King of Israel, the Son of God from a criminal in an instant to a saint, the first of the new dispensation. 
with this unique distinction granted to no other, that he was canonized before he was dead. We see on Calvary played out the great eschatological divide. There were two thieves, the only one was saved. Jesus had said about the day of the coming of the Son of Man, there will be two in a field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Therefore stay away for you do not know the day when your Lord is coming. In this case, two were on the cross, and only one recognized the hour of his visitation. Only one was taken. Jesus had said in St. Matthew's Gospel that when he came in his kingdom, surrounded by the hosts of heaven, he would sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations would be assembled before him, and he would separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Those who were saved, those who cared for him when he appeared under various disguises would hear the words for which human ears are formed in the wombs of our mothers. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Those who are condemned, however, those who failed to care for Jesus when he was sick, naked, hungry, thirsty, imprisoned, Strange, but here depart from me, you were cursed in eternal fire. It was on Good Friday that Jesus mounted his throne. There was a sheep on his right, a goat on his left. The sheep on his right recognized in the totally stripped naked man beside him, and the man who would cry out out of thirst, and the man who hasn't eaten anything, the man who was imprisoned to wood and a man who was a stranger to his own city, kicked out to where there was a dumb, to a man who was as sick as physical torture could sicken. When he cared for that man, Jesus was about to reveal he was caring for God. <laughs> and when the bad thief mocked, he wasn't just doing it to a nobody. Likewise, taking that person. The one on the left, who saw the Lord there personally suffering, mocked Jesus out of selfish interest. Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The one on his right, who despite his own physical sufferings and the difficulty he would have had to say anything, wasn't thinking of himself. But fear God and tried to summon his fellow thief to conversion. Jesus hadn't given us an exhaustive list of charitable needs, but said that any action done would love for another, he would take personally. And he turned to the good thief and promised to take him personally with him all the way to paradise. She preached on this day about this word. A dying man. Ask a dying man for eternal life. A man without possessions. Ask a poor man for kingdom. A thief at the door of death. Ask to die like a thief and steal. Paradise. He knocked on the door of heaven. Once. And the door was immediately opened. He saw it on the he was found. And the reason why we call this day good is we watch goodness personified, crucified. It's because this is the happiest day that Jesus ever had. When we look at the crucifix, we see the happiest man who ever lived at the moment of his supreme triumph. And we're called to say, I want to be like that man. He was happy. Because at least with this one man, his plan for salvation was accomplished. Jesus himself had said, and we couldn't believe it were true unless he himself was the word and the truth and flesh said it. He said, heaven rejoices more. 
for one repentant sinner than for 99 who never needed to repent. And insofar as only one never needed to repent, and she is over my shoulder right now looking at all of us with prayer and love. Insofar as Our Lady was the only one who never needed to repent, and we know how much she pleased God. Jesus is saying that what the good thief did today is almost a hundred times more pleasing because Jesus had come to seek and to save those who are lost. And today that good thief was found. Heaven rejoices in one for one repentant sinner. And heaven rejoiced at the salvation of the good thief. And heaven wants to rejoice in the same way for each of us. St. Thomas Aquinas wrote in his famous Eucharistic in Dorbo Te Vote. Peto quad petivit latro penitens. I ask. For what the good thief asked for. The good thief recognized that he deserved an awful punishment, and with the word he stole Christ's heart and opened for himself the gates of heaven. Today, we make that word of penalty the thief our own, so that we might rejoice in hearing Christ's response in this second word. Echo for us. What do you think? Reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Standing by the cross of Jesus with his mother and his mother's sister Mary. The wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. And Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved. He said to his mother, Behold, woman, behold thy son. And he said to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that day, he took Mary into his home. Christ she saw with 
lifeblood failing, all her anguish unavailing, saw him breathe his very last. Mary found of love's devotion, let me share with true emotion all the sorrow you endured. Virgin, ever intercede, hear me in my fervent plea, fire me with your love of Christ. What is going on in the heart of our mother in these moments is unimaginable for us, since we can never enter fully into the depths of a human heart. And yet, the Holy Spirit has left us this scene recorded in St. John's Gospel. Because it can do us so much good just to watch, and listen, and learn, and grow. She's our mother. I think we can use as, a, as an analogy the experience, I think you're all old enough to have had the, that experience of being close to someone you love who is dying, who is clearly not going to get better, perhaps gasping for breath or, or in pain. But in any cases, we realize that this separation is about to take place, and we wish we could do something. We wish we could say something, we, and we try. But a mother, especially, watching a child who's dying, it's a sense of utter helplessness. Because she wishes, as she had always done during the child, the little one's life and growing up, to lend a hand to fix the problem, to, to heal the wound. But there's nothing at that point, at this point, that she can do. Except Company, her son and her daughter, and be there praying, perhaps holding a hand, perhaps offering a cheerful smile. Our Lady is there, and she can do nothing. And she's listening to this cacophony of ugliness. We've heard these previous meditations, all the mockery that our Lord is going undergoing, and some of it, of course, is going to be as typical, typically happens in these instances, even directed his mother and his family. And Mary, of course, is the mother who loves the most, loving the most lovable of all human beings in this world, and though our Lord is more than is certainly perfect with that. He's innocent. Dying is a criminal. In the midst of this shower of, of abuse. And yet, it's not the same thing as when we accompany a loved one who is dying. Something different is happening here. Mary, her mother, even though we feel it in the moment we accompany someone who is, who is about to leave us, we feel we, we wish, at least we have the emotions, that we wish God could change his mind, that he give us a few more days or weeks or a few more years. Why is he doing this? A kind of note of protest. But Our Lady does not want to change the course of history. In this most sorrowful moment, to embrace it. We heard a few moments ago that our Lord in the midst of his agony is the happiest man on the face of the earth. It sounds so paradoxical. How could it be? But can we not say that our lady in that moment, in this moment that we are reliving here and entering into rather here on Good Friday, is the happiest woman on the face of the earth in the midst of the most excruciating sorrow. Because Mary alone understands what is going on. 
She understands that our Lord is opening his arms to everyone. From Adam and Eve to the last men and women on the face of this earth, to you and me and everyone out there who is part of the crowd or forgotten. And he's giving everything and no one is being left out. And Mary understands that. She grasps that the world is being redeemed. And she doesn't want to change it. She's by there by the foot of the cross, and yet without experience, perhaps emotionally, because it's hard to say, but without feeling like the rebel that we often feel like in the face of no separation. She remembers her son's word, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. And Mary's work is to help in every possible way for her son to accomplish his work. Her food, too, is to do the will of him who sent her as the vessel for his only begotten son. St. Ambrose goes so far as to say, when he's reading sacred scripture, I read of her standing, but not of her weeping. I, mean, we, I think it's, it's, it's very reasonable to, to see in our heart, in our imagination, in our, in our mind's eye, our lady weeping by the cross, and yet, yet with great strength. St. Ambrose protests of anything. She's so strong that this deep knowledge would have kept her without a tear. The pain which Our Lady is enduring here in the passion of her son exceeds all the pains which a human being can endure apart from her son, but it is as Saint, Saint Alphonsus Liguori meditating upon this scene, he said, it is not a barren grief like that of other mothers who behold the sufferings of their children. It was a fruitful grief since through the merits of her profound sorrow and through her love, as St. Augustine would teach us, as she was the natural mother of Jesus, of our head, Jesus Christ, so she then became the spiritual mother of us, who are his faithful members. Cooperating with him by her love, causing us to be born and to be the children of the church. I would suspect, even as Our Lady perhaps is listening to that conversation between Jesus and with thief, she's praying intensely for him. St. Bernard writes that upon Mount Calvary, both of these great martyrs, Jesus and Mary, were silent because the great pain that they endured took from them the power of speaking. The mother looked upon her son in agony upon the cross, and then the son looked upon the mother in agony at the foot of the cross, with torn, torn with compassion for the pains that he suffered. But he doesn't want to leave her alone. To him, the church sings, a virgin, John, he commended his virgin mother. So from the moment of the Lord's death, as it is written, St. John received Mary into his house and assisted and obeyed her throughout her life as if she had been his own mother. And of course, this is the very symbol of what God invites, what Jesus is inviting the church to do at that very moment, to invite Mary into our home, to make a place for her, what a difference she makes. In, so it's almost like a lubrication for the engine that has all its parts functioning and somehow runs poorly. Our Lady, with her charity, with her intercession, taking each one of her children, looking upon them, you, me, with the eyes of her son, makes everything sweeter, easier makes what is impossible possible for us, guides us to the
grace of her son. We remember also that taking this, these words, that Jesus talks to Mary and says, it doesn't say Mary or mother, it says woman. And as some of the fathers of the church point out, what's, what's going on here? That he did, he wants us to understand that that verse of Genesis about the woman who would crush the serpent's head. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. She shall crush your head, and you shall lie in wait for her heel. Very, very translated, but with the same general idea. Again, it says Alphonse, it's not doubted by, it is doubted by none that this woman was the Blessed Virgin Mary, who by the means, by means of her son would crush the head of Satan. If it were not more correct to say that her son, by means of her, would bear him and would do this. Naturally, was Mary the enemy of the serpent, because Lucifer was haughty, ungrateful, and disobedient, while she was humble, grateful, and obedient. It is said, she shall crush your head, because Mary, by means of her son, beat down the pride of Lucifer. It's good, my brothers and sisters, that we Love those tradition, traditional Marian devotions. Above all, the, the rosary. We pray the, the Angelus during the Easter season, the Regina Chaley, um, the Hail Holy Queen, the Memorare, with, with much affection, with great devotion, because Our Lady wants to accompany us just as she accompanied our Lord at, at Canaan. Jesus was invited. But what's interesting in that John's Gospel is Our Lady was invited to that feast, and so was Jesus with the disciples. Almost as if Our Lady was first. The fact that she's there, the problem, the issue that the that the that the, that the, um, the spouse that the spouses see are, are concerned with is seen first by Mary. She's always looking ahead. She's always got an eye open for the ones she loves. All of us. She's the one that points out the problem. She's the one that almost commands with a loving command. Let me put it that way. Our Lord. And it is a to, to, to realize the power that we have when we are close to the one whom the devil so fears. Remember, this is perhaps an odd moment, we we'll finish in a moment, but to remember about, I remember a reading of a lecture that Sigmund Freud gave to his prized students on time. And I'm not quoting exactly, but it's almost, these almost exact words. He says there, he says there, there's nothing that we can do to compare with the healings that, Mary, that, the, that the Blessed Virgin Mary brings about. And he refers to especially at Lourdes. He said there are so many more people who believe in what he called the miracle of the Virgin than in the existence of the unconscious. I don't know what he was thinking about when he made that remark. I'm not going to try to psychoanalyze the father of psychoanalysis, but it seemed like a kind of lament. Nothing we can do can compare with her. And the atheist man would always, would, would from time to time go back to the shrine of Our Lady that he used to be taken to by his Catholic nanny. When people asked him, why did he do that? He couldn't explain it. Well, we can. I'd like to finish with just a point of a couple of points of meditation from St. Jose Maria Escriba. Jesus had been waiting for this meeting with his mother. How many childhood memories? Bethlehem, the flight into distant Egypt, the village of Nazareth. Now again, he wants her by his side on 
out of her. We need her. In the darkness of the night, when a little child is afraid of her, calls out, Mommy. That is what I have to do to cry out many times with my heart. Mommy, mother, don't leave me. There's still a little way to go before reaching true abandonment. If you have not attained it yet, do not worry. Keep up the effort. The day will come when you won't see any other way than him. Jesus, his blessed mother, and the supernatural means that the master has left us. If we are souls of faith, we will give to earthly happenings a very relative importance, just as the saints did. Our Lord and His Mother will not abandon us, and whenever it is necessary, they will make their presence felt to fill the hearts of their loved ones with security and peace. Behold your mother.